All right. Thank you folks for joining in again. I believe this is our sixth episode of the famous Bobby Bowen show. <laughs> it's picking up some steam and uh, I'm glad of that. Thank you all for watching and uh, liking the page and sharing the page. Really appreciate it very much. I want to build this thing up. Uh, we've talked to a lot of people, done a lot of interviews and we got a lot more to go. And uh, this fellow right here is uh, no stranger to the music business. He's been around a long time. And uh, this is Chuck Day. And hey, Chuck, how you doing, man? Doing great, Bobby. Thank you for having me on, man. You're welcome, man. It's an honor to have you. And I've known you for probably 30 years, something like that at, at least. least. Yeah. And uh, a lot of folks uh, that follow me and have uh, followed this page may not uh, know who Chuck Day is. But if you've ever heard a song called Midnight Cry that Gold City made popular back in the 80s, Mm -hmm. This is the fellow that wrote it right here. Yeah, co-wrote that with my brother Greg. Co-wrote with your brother Greg. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So man. I mean, that song has won so many awards. It was Song of the Year and uh, Song of the Decade, wasn't it? Uh, yes. And uh, they had it in the list of one of the top twenty of the century. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they told us here uh, at the Quartet Convention several years ago they had us come and gave us a plaque for it being the most recorded song in the history of. Uh, popular Christian music. That is, yeah, all genres. That is really considered. awesome, right there, man. You yeah, ought to be living in a mansion. Man, <laughs> if I hadn't have been dumb, I might have been. I yeah, we signed all, the wrong kind of contract, I, I we, guess. But uh, we've it's all, all been through that anyway, so I ain't worried yeah. about that. We've all been through that dumb stuff we've done when we were oh, younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah didn't man. know any better. Just, just <laughs> grabbed a hold of anything that that was sparkly and shiny, you know. Just, yeah, just glad to be there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, uh, Chuck, I want to go, I, I've been doing this with everybody I've been talking with interviewing and, mm -hmm. and, uh, I just want you to go back to the, the beginning. Uh, everybody's told where they were born and when mm -hmm. you don't want to tell when, so people can figure your age out. You know, we can leave that uh, a, a mystery. I a secret. <laughs> but, uh, just tell us that. And then kind of go from where, uh, where you, how would you were when you, when you felt like, uh, I want to be a musician. I want to be a singer. What were your influences early on in your younger years? Okay, Bobby. Well, I was born in Alexandria, Louisiana, and uh, my dad was in the Air Force, so I was born in an Air Force hospital there. We lived there for a, a year, and then we were transferred to New Jersey and Delaware up in that area. And uh, so I lived there long enough to get the hot sauce in my blood. That's where and, you got uh, your... Uh... That's where you got your accent from, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> New Jersey. I did, I did come home with a, with a New Jersey accent for sure. People would wow. just laugh at me when I was a kid. But uh, when I was about <clears throat> five years old, we moved back to our hometown, which is Adel, Georgia, down in extreme southern Georgia. And uh, we uh, lived in a little small house. Dad worked at, in civil service out at Moody Air Force Base at that time. He had retired from the Air Force or or gotten out of the Air Force after about 13, 15 years, something like that. And um, so I went from uh, first grade through third grade in uh, Adel, and then we moved to Valdosta when my dad could be closer to his work. And uh, so from there on out through high school, I went uh, to the Valdosta school system. And uh, when I was uh, about 10 years old, well, I guess probably when I was about eight, my dad got, went down to Western Alto and bought me a guitar. And, uh, and what kind of guitar was that? Uh, it was one of those, uh, oh gosh, I can't even think of it now, but it's, so I robot. still had it. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. It would look just like the series. It's probably made by the same people. Silver tone or something like uh, that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it was a uh, little arch top acoustic and, uh, tobacco sunburst. I do remember that. And, uh, I broke all the strings off of it before and, uh, one day when I was about 10 years old, I'd been fooling around with it. And I learned, it wasn't in tune, obviously, it only had four strings, but I learned how to play uh, the Wildwood Flower on four strings. Wow. So when my dad come home from work, he was a carpenter and builder at that time. And uh, he came home from work that afternoon and I said, listen to this, dad. And uh, so we had supper that night and he said, come get in the truck with me. And we went down to J.C. Penney's. And he bought me a set of guitar strings, a black diamond guitar strings. Oh yeah. And, uh, and he bought me three guitar picks and said, don't you lose these now. And, uh, cause they cost uh, 10 cents a piece back mm. then. Yeah. It, it was big money. And, uh, so we went back to the house and strung it up and 
My mom played little guitar. Her family's very musical. She had an uncle who was a Grand Ole Opry staff musician back in the day and uh, played uh, with everybody from George Jones to George Hamilton IV and all of those people. And uh, she, uh, she taught me the key of uh, C and D. Uh-huh. And my dad called, taught me the key of G. So I learned those. And uh, then later on, mom showed me F. And so that got me started. And, and uh, uh, if you're like, if you're like every guitar player that start, begins, it tears the fingers up. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. And that was, uh, oh. but I didn't care, man. I was ripping yeah. it. I was, I was, I was same so way. excited. And uh, so we got to be, uh, got to be a little bit more proficient with it. And he took me down to the pawn shop and bought me an electric guitar and an amp. It was just well, a, it, it was probably a Dan Electro because it looked just like the old Dan Electros, you know, the ones that have the, the, the vinyl covering on them. Yeah. It was purple. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I played that and I learned to pick some like that. And uh, so he said, uh, one day we went down to the music store and he bought me a Gibson B25. Ooh, that was a small, small frame acoustic, kind of like a parlor guitar. Yes. And, uh, and that was my first one, first real guitar. And about that time I was 12 and uh, I started singing at church with my mom and uh, she found out that I could sing harmony and uh, I was singing baritone at, uh, at 10 years old. And uh, the, we kind how did of started, you, how did you learn that part? I don't know. It just came to me. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, I, you know, I did the same thing and it was because I listened to other people at church uh, sing harmony, you know, and that's how I, I think that's it probably it. Yeah. Probably the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Bobby, because uh, Greg, my brother, uh, you know, when he, he was five years younger, or still is five years younger than I am, but uh, yeah. one day he walked up at, when I, at seven, right in the same time period, um, and we were, me and mom were practicing in the living room at the piano, and uh, he walks up and starts singing perfect tenor, just like that off the bat, yeah. and uh, so my mom was like, hey... <laughs> I got somebody else to sing with me at church now. And so yeah. uh, we started to develop our, our, our vocal abilities. You know, mom practiced with us a lot and we didn't sing like kids. We sang like adults, you know, we, we sang out of our diaphragm. She taught us that early. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, my mom was a great singer and songwriter and uh, she was a church of God lady evangelist. Wow. She uh, a little Pentecostal lady. And she'd been preaching since she was 16. When she got saved, the Lord called her to preach. And she had run revivals. Sometimes her revivals would last three or four weeks. Yeah. And uh, so she uh, she had a great music uh, influence in her life. And she influenced us to do the same thing. Uh, right after we started singing, we were going around to churches and singing at these, you know, all night singings they used to have back in the days. And uh, this old guy walks up to Bomb one night and said, uh, when are y'all going to make a record? Back then, they were actually yeah. LPs, you big know. Big old 33s, yeah. Big old 33 and the thirds, yeah. And, and uh, so Mom said, well, we're just kind of saving the money. She said, well, what do you think it'll cost to make one? And Mom said, well, what we figured it was going to cost and told him. And he says, well, I'll pay for it. And y'all don't have to borrow it. Just give, we'll give you the money. He owned a big chicken egg ranch made uh -huh. the had laying hens and uh, he said, uh, y'all go wherever you want to go. So we took off to Madisonville, Kentucky to the Goodman family studio. Yes. Yes. And uh, at uh, 12 years old, made our now, first record. What year was this? Uh, Lord, I, Bobby, I'm the worst with that. It must uh, have it been the early seventies, early seventies, around 72 or yeah. 74, somewhere in that range. Yeah. But uh, Rusty Goodman produced our album uh, wow. for us. And wound up being my mentor through the through my teenage years. I mean, yeah. uh, a sincere mentor. He was one of the greatest men I ever knew. Yeah. Um, but Rusty um, produced, and uh, Eddie Crook played the piano mm -hmm. on those sessions because the Goodman Family Band. Uh, the only person that wasn't on the Goodman Family Band on the first uh, session was the bass player. They brought in Larry Strelecki out of Nashville. That would have been uh, their brother Bobby back then. Uh, Bobby played bass for him back then, but yeah. they brought in uh, 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 Henry Strelecki and uh, yes, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, they brought Jimmy Caps in to play uh, electric guitar. 
Oh, Jimmy. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> he, he's amazing. And uh, he is, um, I think, just got in the Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken, or, or I think about so. to. Yeah. I, but, I, saw, uh, I saw something on uh, it's, it might have been YouTube or Facebook or maybe maybe TV, you know, where they did a documentary on him. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's uh, he he was uh, a staff musician on the Opry for years and years, yeah. and uh, he finally got uh, uh, a little bit past what they were looking for in the age group. I think yeah. that yeah. new new people came on. Oh you know? yeah, you know happens to all is. of us. Oh yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, he plays on Larry's Country Diner now, man. So uh, yeah, that's bigger than the Opry. maybe that's where I saw it was the RFD network. Yeah, yeah. very possible. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, we we started singing as a group then and went on uh about the same time bobby my mom took a job with uh jg whitfield you remember him uh from pensacola florida they called him the old gospel man oh yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. i think oh, yeah. he actually oh, yeah yeah he looked kind of like uh well i used to think he was jd sumner's brother or uh, yeah exactly <laughs> the old florida boys uh bass singer they used to have the glasses yeah i think it, they may have been kids like each billy other. todd yeah yeah, uh, Todd. Yeah, man. Well, uh, actually, at that time, I think he owned the Florida Boys and the Dixie Echoes Quartet. He was uh, he owned a big grocery store chain down there in Pensacola in that Panhandle area. So they had, I think, thirty or forty big supermarkets like Win Dixie type. Yeah, stores. I think he uh, actually back uh, when the Goodmans and the Inspirations were touring together back in the early seventies, I think he actually went with them and was the MC to all those concerts. I, remember, I wouldn't doubt that. I remember going to a concert and seeing them in Texarkana when I was about eight or nine years old. And I remember him being there and introducing yeah. the groups. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, there were only two big guys in the country back then. That was uh, JD, uh, JD. <laughs> that was uh, uh, WB Mallon from out in yeah. uh, Fort Texas. Worth. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, JG Whitfield. Yep. from Pensacola and uh, they were the two main promoters in the country yep. and uh, mom took a job doing all of his promotions in the South Georgia area huh. and uh, so we lived in Valdosta so they had a big auditorium there set, set about 1500 uh, people at big stage and a big place for buses to back in the back and all it was a nice building and uh, so he would put on about four shows a year there and mom would sell the advertising book and uh, sell all the tickets and he would just send her the, the checks for the groups and she'd pay the groups at the end of the show. And we opened up all of those shows from the time I was 12 till I was 18. And wow. uh, so I, I got to be on stage with everybody in the business. Yeah. And uh, that's how I met um, so many of the people that we still are friends with. You know, What was the name of your group back then? The Day Family. The Day Family. Okay. Mm -hmm the day family and it was my brother greg uh my mom and my dad and me huh. and we traveled uh all over florida alabama south carolina georgia tennessee pretty much in those four states so now did you uh group. did you have any original songs or were you just uh we singing did. other people's songs no we well our first album was all covers uh our first single off that was uh i think it was why me lord maybe uh yeah that was the first one and uh, I did that song. And then um, my mom wrote a lot of songs back then. And so we did uh, Victory Bells was the name of one of the albums. Uh, I Found a Better Way. Uh, oh, yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of songs she wrote. Back yeah. to Calvary. She wrote that song, I Found a Better I, Way? I think so. I may be mistaken about that. Because you know how you're when you're a kid, you think all kind of stuff. And then you start believing it, even though I, there is no Santa Claus. I sang that song when I was a kid, man. Oh, I found a better way, brighter Maybe. path for my yeah, better one. Yeah, that's the same song. She must yeah. not have wrote that one. But uh, <laughs> she wrote a bunch. We had a, probably, I would say, by the time we did the, the third album, it was over half originals. And the last album was probably three-quarters originals. But you hadn't written anything yet at that point. At that time, no, I had not. Yeah. Um, and I didn't write till much, year, till much later. Absolutely, later, later, later. Um, I learned to play the piano there with mom and played the guitar, the drums and, mm -hmm. and the bass and stuff like that. But, you know, as far as getting into writing, I didn't really even think about it until I got out and uh, playing country music and then started writing some. So speaking of country music, uh, you played with some pretty well-known stars. Name, name a few of them. Uh, well, 
uh, was on the road with Freddie Fender for a little while. And uh, then uh, wasted Marty Haggard. days and wasted nights. <laughs> oh, yeah. I do an impersonation of him sometimes. Let's hear it. Not, Let's hear it. I can't do it. I have to be in a certain key. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> can't do it on my full stomach. And I just got through Chick-fil-A in it a few minutes ago. So <laughs> You know, he was, uh, he was Hispanic, right? Yeah. And uh, so he was like, like kind of like, uh, what's, uh, what's the black guy that, was in country music. Uh, oh, uh, Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride. He was the only yeah. black guy in country music, and Freddie Fender was the only Hispanic guy. Right. And, uh, I mean, they were both had huge hits. Yeah, over man. The years. And uh, I mean, there's no nobody was prejudiced or anything. Didn't seem like back then. You know, they accepted well, them both in country music. And and here's the thing about all of that stuff, man. That's you know, there's been so many stupid things that's happened through society. You know, and culturally, oh, yeah. uh, things have been. Uh, wrong and everything but you know true talent will always make its way through you know uh, people yeah. that are and 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 i'm i'm a believer in the anointing of sure. god on a yes, person's sir. life and i don't think you have to just sing gospel music to be anointed no and i believe that god puts people in a certain place at a certain time to 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 do something that we may not it may not have no, anything to do with charlie pride's or Freddie Fender's recording career, yeah. it could have been something completely different that we don't even know, but it's God's plan. So, you know, he, he orders our steps. He orders you know? our steps. He, and sure he does. knows he's not surprised by anything. So no, I say that all the time. Yeah. Surprised at all. But, um, just in, in, in a little bit more finishing up my story, I guess the best way to tell you is that, uh, in all of that, uh, uh, getting to meet, Rusty and Rusty working with me and uh, <clears throat> interesting story, uh, kind of give you a little picture of what kind of person he was. Uh, Rusty was uh, working with us in the studio when I was uh, on our third album. I was going through the voice change. Oh, and yeah. uh, and uh, so mom and dad wasn't gonna let me sing on the record. And so whenever we got in, into the studio and I mean the musicians are all in their chairs and Rusty walks out, he said, what are we starting first with? and and uh, he said, why don't we start with Chuck one, start off with, because, you know, he was he was my, my guy, you know. And and uh, mom says, oh, he's not singing on this album. He says, what? Do you remember that? Well, he's going through the voice change. He said, here's what we're going to do. Everybody take a break. And he sent the musicians down to the break room, sent mom and daddy back out to the motor home. And uh, he took a stool and put me on it. And uh, he sat in front of me on one with his guitar and he sat there and worked with me for about 30 minutes. And sure enough, whatever he told me to do in 30 minutes, I was able to sing on that album. And we went ahead and, and I got to sing on the album. And, and uh, from so that good. time, I, I was burnt, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, that is that, awesome, man. During that session, after, you know, we were there for a week to record. So we, you know, and back then we, was, we were recording on eight, the first two were on four tracks two inch yeah and the next were on two inch eight track ampex machines mm. you know reel to reels big and time. uh yeah we were big time man eight <laughs> tracks wow yeah. and uh so we got uh everything you know down with the music and then we come back and put the vocals on and work on that stuff and get it all right there wasn't any tuning back then oh no no going back and punching you in or whatever everything was done in real time analog it was old school so oh yeah um <clears throat> we were down to the last day we were finishing up the the last little bit of vocals and then they were going to mix it after we left and we had booked a revival to go back home. We had worked a week's revival on the way up there to help us pay our way. And we had one for a week in, in uh, Tryon, Georgia on the way back home. And uh, we were going to be there for a week. So everything we owned was in this motor home and it was brand new. My dad had just bought it. It's a 28 foot champion motor. Wow. wow. And uh, we were, we were thrilled to death with it. And so during that session, dad went out and unplugged it from the shore power and uh, turned on the generators first time we'd ever used the generator uh. and uh so he was going to get it all cooled off and ready for us because we were going to head out and start heading toward our revival which we had to be there on saturday night and um so uh we're going along there a little bit all of a sudden the doors of the studio bust wide open and vestal goodman 
is barefooted <laughs> in a house dress and her back then her hair was that tall look like yeah. Marge Simpson yeah and her hair had <laughs> fallen over off the, she was running so hard her hair fell over and she was screaming at the top of her lungs that day family camper is burning to the ground oh man and uh we walked out there and sure enough man that thing was you know burning down and she had called the the uh the fire department already and and so by the time we got out there we could hear the sirens coming and they come and they put it out and it burned down uh it was a total loss we lost oh, everything all of man. our clothes shoes we had everything we had it was in there and uh so we're standing there watching it be put out and here comes uh, a car driving up and out gets uh uh ronnie henson and uh he comes over there and him and rusty were talking and i was standing there next to rusty i was like inseparable man i was right there you know yeah yeah and uh he um uh, we got through and everything got settled down and rusty said well listen uh you guys are not going to go to a hotel you're going to go uh to my house and you're going to stay with us till we get this all sorted out and you can figure out how you're going to get home and what you're going to do so uh <clears throat> The next night we're sitting at his table having dinner uh, and we had uh, finished up and Rusty said, well, I've got to go up to the studio and uh, work on a song for the al for our album. And uh, Mr. Day, do you mind if Chuck goes up there with me? And dad said, of course not. You know, so I, I was thrilled to death. I got to go with Rusty to the studio. So uh, Larry Maglinger was the uh, engineer that day and he was uh, in there at the, in the booth and I sat next to him there uh, up at the console and Rusty was uh, in his old purple, them old purple group pants they used to wear. Yeah, He had done taking those for casual now <laughs> and had on a white v-neck uh, t-shirt and a pair of white kids uh, slip-ons. Wow. And uh, you know, I had that bushy hair and had his glasses down on his nose. He was standing out there in front of the music stand and they had all the orchestration all finished on the record. It was already mixed down. He was just putting the vocals on it. And uh, it was a song, How Much More. Yes. You remember that song? Oh, yes. And yes. Uh, so I got to watch him record the vocals on that. I was just sitting up there squalling at, that, oh. at the console because he was like my hero, you know. But it was yeah. such a moment in time. And, of course, that turned out to be a huge song for him. And That, uh, that is so – what a story, man. I yeah, mean, I was, I was blessed. I, you know, I, I grew up a, a big Happy Goodman family fan. Yeah. yeah until the Hensons came along. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. But, but man, uh, you know, I listened to those records constantly when I was a kid. And how much more, what a wonderful song. And I, it, man, that just, that makes me, I'm excited to hear you say that you were actually there when he yeah. was doing the vocals on that. That's, that is really you cool. Wanna, you want to hear something else weird about that trip? I'd love to. When we got uh, to Rusty's house the first day, whenever the the, home, the motor home burned down, uh, he took mom and dad and told them they were going to stay in the guest room. And uh, he said, you boys are going to stay downstairs. It's all finished up in the basement down there. And he said, uh, the couch lets out into a bed and uh, y'all could sleep down there. And so he takes us downstairs. And when we get downstairs, you'll never believe who was down there. Uh, Kenny. Kenny. Henson <laughs> and Larry Henson were living in his basement. There well, were two that was, so that would have been there. the time that would have been the time that they had moved from California. Right after they moved from California, yeah. And yeah, they were in Madisonville still. And they didn't have a place to live. They were living on the bus or Ronnie and his wife. Yeah. yeah I think exactly. Bo was Bo was born around that time. Yeah. And so they yeah, were living yeah. on the bus and the rest yeah. of them were living I guess Yvonne was married. Yeah. And so they had a place, but uh, Kenny and Larry were right there. At Rusty's, at Rusty's house. house. Wow, yeah. that is yeah. awesome, man. And that's so we spent the week with them there and got to got to be friends and and uh, became lifelong friends. Kenny was such a great, uh, oh yeah, amazing. Yes, of course Larry was too, man. Larry, yeah, Larry was a, a powerhouse and he still is. I I got a chance to was over at uh, Weston, Kenny's son. Yeah, we were over there here a while back. Uh, had supper with him in in Hendersonville and. And uh, Larry and his wife came over and we played games that evening, just sitting around. We laughed and talked That's and cut cool. up and had the biggest time. I got to get a hold of Larry and get him on here. And, and uh, 
I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get a hold of Ronnie too and see if I can do it with him. But uh, I mean, I, I could sit and listen to, for hours, and I know they could talk for hours because they like oh, to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Man, some of the greatest people, but anointed, you know. Yes, they're yes. they're set apart for this time. You know, there was never a concert that I didn't go to, Happy Goodmans and the Hensons, that I didn't feel an anointing during yeah. the concert. Oh, you could, it was like electricity in the air. Yes, man. exactly. People throwing babies up in there. Yeah. You know, it was great. We had uh, so many of those concerts that mom would promote. We would have the Goodmans, the Hensons, the Inspirations, Florida Boys, Dixie Echoes, all on one show. Yeah. You know, and you, yes. nowadays it's hard to get one headliner on. But I know. But not to mention having six or seven. Yeah, yeah. We worked with the Oak Ridge Boys back then a lot. Uh, man, just so many I, people. I'm, I'm learning so much about every guy that I'm talking to, except, you know, for the guys I travel with. I knew a right. lot of their background. But uh, talking to you and Gene Reasoner, uh, you know, hearing your background, I mean, I never never knew all this stuff. And yeah. now I'm just learning it with everybody else, and I'm just blown away by your story, man. Well, I appreciate the platform because this is what we've been needing for a long time. You know, all of us guys that are in the industry, we see each other at convention every year and, and uh, we get here sing one or two songs and we think we know them. Yeah. And we really don't. We don't yeah. know anything about their culture, anything about their upbringing. And, and right. uh, so this gives people a chance to see a little snapshot into our life, you know. So let's move on from, uh, you know, uh, after the, all that, you know, you, I, I mentioned earlier about you playing with some country uh, artists. Mm -hmm. Freddie Fender was one. Uh huh. And Marty and Haggard. Mar Marty Haggard. That was yeah, Merle, Merle Merle Haggard's son. son. Yeah. And what uh, year would this have been? That would have probably been in the very early '80s, probably around '83. Okay. Right. So, what led time. you? What made you go from gospel to country? What What happened there? <laughs> Well, did you stray uh, away like a lot of us did? <laughs> I, I did. I have to say that um, I was raised, you know, in a strict Pentecostal church and yeah. and uh, everything was a sin. And I kind of went wild for a while. Yeah. I was never a bad guy mm -hmm. and I was never a dope addict. I mean, right. I smoked a bunch of dope, but I was never like, you know, shooting heroin or anything yeah. like that. I mean, you know, I'd pop a few, few pills and, and smoke a few joints and drink a lot of beer. But, wow. you know. See, I oh, never yeah. got into that stuff. Well, never, you're blessed. I never you're did blessed. because uh, I was afraid. You know, I knew what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to be a gospel singer. Yeah. And I thought, man, if I if I give in and do that stuff with my classmates when I got, you know, 11th or 12th grade, like everybody was partying. Yeah. They wanted me to come along with them. I thought, if I do that, God's going to take away my talent, and I'll never get to do what I want to do. So I was I afraid that God would, would take it away from me if I did it. I was – probably halfway through my 19th year before I ever did anything at all like that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I had been on the road after leaving mom and dad, I went on the road with uh, Wendy Johnson and the messengers as their lead guitar player. They're one of the top five groups back then, Canaan records yeah. uh, and uh, left them. And when that, when they disbanded, I went with uh, the, with a group called uh, the Vikings out of Benson, North Carolina, which changed their name to Glory Road. Uh, they were with uh, Calvary Records, which the Hensons were with. Right. And uh, then I went from there to uh, work with the Roger Horn Trio. I don't know if you remember Roger. He's a great songwriter, but he was tenor singer for the uh, uh, cathedrals right before Danny, I think before Danny came. Before? Before Kirk, Danny Funderburg. Actually, uh, Kirk Talley. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right before Danny Kirk. came after Kirk Talley, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you've been right before Kirk. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I about forgot about Kirk yeah. singing with me. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, and uh, then after that, I came home and worked in radio for a while at my in my hometown. And uh, my brother got went into the Air Force. He got stationed down in Fort Walton Beach at uh, Herbert Field down there. And uh, he had a cushy job. He worked three days a week and he was off the rest of the time and he never worked the weekends. So uh, my dad take, had taken a job down there as a building superintendent over a bunch of condos being built on the beach down in Destin. And they were living down there. So I moved down there. The whole family was down there. So I moved down there to hang out with them. And uh, we started, my mom was pastor in the little church of God there. Uh, and uh, so we met some a young couple and, uh, and they had a friend who was a drummer and we started singing gospel music, me and 
my brother and these th other three people. And uh, then uh, one day the bass player comes in that he's married to the girl singer. And uh, he says, I, I've entered us in a talent contest. And I said, I'm not doing talent contest. And he said, no, I'm serious. I've entered us in the Wrangler uh, Jeans Dodge Truck Country Showdown. Mm. I said, really? He said, yeah, and that's cost me $200. So we're not wasting my money. Can't get wow. it back. So we went to my mom's church and learned us some country songs. And uh, we went down and, and we got into it uh, in Pensacola. And uh, we won. I mean, like, tore it down, brought the house down. I mean, they were, like, freaking out. Because wow. we had the anointing on us, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and uh, so... Uh, as, uh, that went on, we, we actually won there. We won the next one and they sent us to the state, which was at the Gator Bowl during the big Florida fair over yeah. there in Jacksonville. Yeah. So, uh, we were on the Gator Bowl. It was packed and we won that and they sent us to Nashville to the finals. And we went up and did that at the Grand Ole Opry house there, uh, where it is now. And, uh, we came in. I think seventh, huh. uh, but the Forrester sisters won. That, oh yeah, that, yeah. That, they yeah. were the ones that kind of what launched their career. But uh, we came back and uh, actually got picked up in Pensacola at a at a club down there as their house band, and it kind of went downhill from there. And uh, <clears throat> I went over to Bruton, Alabama, and worked at a club, and that's where I actually was convicted of my sins. And uh, I remember standing up there, man, I was coked out of my mind and high and mm. and drunk all at the same time wow. and uh the holy spirit came in there man and touched my heart and uh i saw those people dancing it looked like all the little pentecostal ladies dancing around i used to see <laughs> in front of the church you know oh yeah and uh, uh uh right after that a pastor called me on the phone uh it, was, it turned out to be the person who led me to the lord and uh he called me on the phone in the bar because that mama told him where I was and gave him the number. And so he tracked me down. And I said, what do you want? He said, I just want to call you and tell you how much I love you. And he started talking to me. And uh, he never did holler at me. He never did tell me how dumb I was. He just yeah. told me that, don't you ever forget, Chuck Day, that Jesus loves you. Yeah. And I love you. Wow. And uh, I had a big old buzz going when I was talking to him. I lost it. Couldn't even get drunk that night. Wow. The Holy Spirit just dealt with me, and it wasn't but about a month later that I left, and I went back home, and just a few weeks later, I went down to the altar and gave my heart to the Lord, and That's awesome, man. God saved me. Yeah. That's because, you know, he had a plan for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. from there, uh, was this was after, when you, after you'd played for uh, Marty and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did that in between that time. When I first yeah. went down there, you know, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on. So I had yeah. that opportunity. I met uh, a club that I happened to go hang out in a lot. And uh, they were uh, the guy there that uh, owned that club. He was pretty uh, big in the music scene down there. And he promoted some shows outside of the club. They did a lot of concerts on the beach and stuff down there. So he uh, had that, and that's the way that I met the first person was was uh, Marty Haggard. I met him, and then uh, I think we had uh, done a show together with uh, Freddie and Freddie uh, met us and and uh, said, "Well, listen, I'm going to be down that way. Uh, you guys want to play for me?" And uh, we wound up going on tour on a tour with him, and we did that whole Panhandle of Florida and down into the state a little bit and. We were there, I guess we were with him probably a month and a half because he didn't have a full-time band. He just uh -huh. did pick up bands like that. And he'd just get a different band for each tour he was going to do. So, yeah. What yeah. an experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was. It was interesting. He was an interesting guy. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> was he, uh, I guess he spoke English pretty good, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So just, he could just do yeah. both. Bilingual. Oh, yeah. He was, he was definitely bilingual. He would uh, get mad and cuss you out in Spanish. He didn't. So he didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Big ending. <laughs> wow. So, uh, so, so after you got, uh, you turned your life back around to Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, the music was still there. So you were right. like, okay, I'm going to start singing gospel music again. How, how did that, how did that uh, I went home and, uh, 
I didn't do anything for a good while. Uh, I was, took a job uh, when I got saved. Uh, I took a job at a radio station in Baxley, Georgia. And uh, I was working AM station doing gospel show in the afternoon, afternoon drive. Mm -hmm. And then the, after that was over, then I would, I would uh, run the FM station, which was automated until midnight and it signed off. And then uh, I got to where I was doing live shows on Friday nights, request shows, and uh, that took off pretty well. And uh, I got a call one night from a guy in uh, Soperton, Georgia, that owned a station up there and asked me if I'd be interested in coming and talking to him. So I went and talked to him and wound up taking the management position there and running the station as well and be, as well as being on the air. And uh, during that time, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Stan Schumann, I don't know if you've ever run across Stan, he used to be with Jerry Goff back years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, he was with Wendy Johnson of the Messengers and uh, with Roger Horn Trio when I was with him. He's a great baritone singer. And, uh, but uh, he had gotten in a group with the, called the Accords out of Macon, Georgia. And uh, he asked me if I would be interested in playing guitar for him. And uh, so I didn't even have a guitar, man. I had sold everything I had to get out of what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, so I went down to the music store and bought a, uh, a Telecaster on time. It was a Japanese Telecaster. Uh -huh. uh, it wasn't real, you know, yeah. it yeah. was a Tokai, I think was the name of it. <laughs> Turns out now that guitar is worth $3,000. Oh my goodness. And you <laughs> I paid 150 for it. I don't have it. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, started playing with them. And then uh, uh, right after that, my, uh, the tenor singer got called to preach and left the group. And uh, so Greg came on as the tenor singer. And then the bass singer had a heart attack and couldn't travel anymore. So they said, you're gonna sing bass and play lead guitar, Ooh. which is weird. Yeah, that would be. But I pulled it off. I mean, I, I think I did a good job. Uh, but we had a group back then, a guy named Ken Beck played the piano, played keyboards. And he used to play with, with the Carpenters back when they had a band and was traveling. He played mm -hmm. electronic keyboards. Yeah. Uh, behind them and uh, so he was an amazing programmer so he programmed the drums we had a bass player I played lead and he played piano and he was an awesome piano player so we had a group that was more like the Gaither vocal band before yeah. there was a Gaither vocal band back yeah. then I mean it was real upscale southern gospel music uh -huh. and a little edgy and uh, but uh, we had a had two or three songs in the singing news that got in the top five and that kind of stuff, you know, back then. And, yeah. uh, uh, just, uh, I guess that's kind of how I got back into gospel music. And then, uh, I quit singing with them, got married. And then uh, a little while later, we started the days with my yeah. brother, Greg and his wife at that time, Heather, yeah. uh, Roop, who, yeah. uh, was Roop up sisters. the, the yeah. Roop sisters. Yeah. yeah. Now, they're called sisters sisters. Yeah. That's their name of their group now. But, uh, uh, she is a great talent, wonderful girl. And, uh, we had a, uh, pretty good, pretty good career. Uh, started off with Eddie Crook in the Southern gospel. And, uh, we started going more and more toward the country. And, uh, when it came down to the end of the time, he says, now, listen, it's time to renew your contract. You guys need to uh, shave off those beards and uh, put on a suit and a tie and let's get down to business mm -hmm. and we were kind of like um that's kind of not what our vision is yeah <laughs> you know and uh so it wound up that uh we got a showcase at the quartet convention uh about the same time that gene Reasoner wore the red duster yes and we uh talked about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Uh, and uh, so we were up there with that. We, we, we carried a full band. We had a steel guitar player, drummer, bass, lead guitar, and, and uh, piano. And uh, so we got up and did our show, and uh, Bill Trailer was sitting there in the audience, and he was literally holding his telephone up for some other people to hear it, uh, the cell phone, you know. And uh, after it was over, he, he says, I want you guys to, to consider coming with, uh, with us over at Homeland, we're starting a, a new label for Christian country music. He said, yeah. that's what you guys are. Yeah. And we said, yeah, that's what our heart's for. So we wound up going there and uh, we recorded a new, the new step album over there with those guys. Yeah. 
So, so Dirk, Dirk Johnson produced that record. Yeah. And, uh, man, and how long, done. how long was, the, were the days, uh, actually, uh, traveling and singing? How I many believe, years? I believe we were together for eight years. Eight years. And when did it start? Eight or 13. Lord, Bobby. Are you? I'm the, world, I'm the world's worst. I don't even know my wife's birthday, man. Oh my goodness. No, I do know my wife's birthday. You know, guy, I, he's telling I me what it was. You know, I don't understand why. I don't understand why guys are this way. Why can't we remember dates? I don't know, man. You know, I tell so we have a reason to get in trouble, I guess. I tell everybody that I picked my wife and I's wedding date, which was January the eighth, uh -huh. because I didn't want to forget it. Because you, you know who was born on January the eighth? Come you. on, no, come on, Jeff. Elvis. Oh, <laughs> that's the last person I expected yeah. to hear you say. <laughs> so that helps me remember, you know, when it's Elvis's yeah. birthday, it's my anniversary. Oh, you know? my gosh. Pretty smart, huh? You're wrong, man. <laughs> that's awesome. How many years do you say I think I was talking over you? Seven years. Seven years. We were together. When yeah. did it start? 88. Okay. We started singing because we won Song of the Year for Midnight Cry in 87 or 88 actually. So that's okay. when we actually started singing was around 88, 89, right in that So time. we were actually recording with Eddie Crook the same time you guys were. Right. Yeah. Y'all yeah. were on uh, the other label. We were yeah. on, y'all were on Morningstar. Yeah. Right. You were on, yeah. uh, the, and we were on Harvest. It? Harvest. That's it. Yeah. And yeah, we, uh, we did our last project with Eddie in 88. That was the last, yeah. last one. So we went to Word Records after that. Yeah. So, that's right. Uh, yeah. But he never told us to shave our beards off. Well, we couldn't grow a beard back then, so he didn't <laughs> tell us to do that. And we were still wearing not really suits and ties, matching suits and ties and all like, like the quartets were, but we were still wearing slacks and yeah. jackets. And back then, we started wearing these little bolo ties. Now, I remember y'all doing that, and yeah. Vest and things like that. We were slowly moving into the, the country gospel look, you know, back yeah. then, so. Well, we did a lot of shows with y'all back then. You we and did all on White River and that's right. Pennsylvania and all up in that yep. area quite a bit. Yeah, you guys, you guys were awesome. Uh, White River was awesome. I mean, it was just great, a great time back then when we all got together and did did concerts together. It was just, uh, Jeff and Sherry Easter, you know, yeah, all that. So it was it was awesome. They uh, they stayed Southern Gospel. They knew where their bread was buttered at, man. Yeah, Jeff's a little smarter than we were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's kind of brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very brilliant. You know, he he kind of he straddled the fence a little bit, but he didn't go too far on one side or the other. You know, he, yeah, exactly. he kept his roots right there where he, he knew his bread and butter was. Yeah, yeah you're for sure. They're right. amazing. They're amazing. They are. Still, they are still know? doing it, man. Still putting out great music. Yeah, but uh, that's that's kind of my story. Got buried, you know, back in in uh, in that time uh, during all of that same time we got married. Just about spent our honeymoon at the Cortez Convention. Yeah. And yes. uh, we had been married, but about what, a week or so, and uh, and shared a room in the motel with my mom. Oh wow, what a honeymoon! <laughs> yeah, uh, it, we had a better honeymoon than that, but it was well. I hope so. Only a couple of weeks before, but have mom have mom leave the room for a while, you know? Yeah, go sightseeing mom, or something. I yeah. think they got breakfast down there. If you want to yeah, go. yeah, go to breakfast for about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and one of the nights, Greg and Heather came up, so it was all of us piled in one. Oh, my goodness. We was poor as dirt back then. Uh, man. Yeah, I, I, I remember those days, you know. <laughs> you know, we, I talked earlier about when I introduced you about Midnight Cry, mm -hmm. and you've, you've written tons of songs over the years, but Midnight Cry had to be the biggest, you know. Yes. It, and it is, uh, so yeah. what inspired you and Greg to, to write a song like that? Uh, we had gone, we were singing with the Accords at that time, and uh, we had a weekend off. The married guys wanted to go be home with their families one weekend every, out of every six. So the fifth, after the fifth weekend, the sixth weekend would be our weekend off. And uh, so we went down to see my mom and dad, and they were starting a revival at their church with a evangelist by the name of Billy Swain. Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy is an end times preacher, did a lot of the, uh, you know, Revelation, Book of Daniel teaching, that kind of stuff, had charts yeah. and very educated man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had been on a fast right before this for 40 days, water only, locked up in a room over the garage, didn't even see his family for 40 days. Wow. Does it every year. And really? uh, he, he prays during that time for God to give him his messages for the year, uh, for his, 
you know, sermons and that kind of, he takes, the only thing he takes in there is his pad and his Bible and his pen. And uh, there's no TV, there's yeah. no stereo, there's no, you know, CD player, nothing. No Facebook. And, uh, <laughs> no, and, and he's, he's in there, no computer or anything. Yeah. And uh, so during that time, uh, he'd gotten this message, and that was the first morning that he preached since coming off of the fast, and that was the first sermon that he preached. He said, if I had, <clears throat> he said, uh, let me put it this way. He said, uh, what I'm seeing, he said, I, we're on a spiritual time clock. And uh, it's 1159, and the seconds are counting down to midnight. Mm -hmm. He said, if I had a title for this sermon, I'd just simply call it The Midnight Cry. Wow. And I pulled out a business card and wrote it on the back of a business card, stuck it in my shirt pocket because I said, That's, there's a song in there. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm going to put that down. And so that afternoon, we went back to Mama's. We had lunch and uh, we went in uh, the living room together, me and Greg, and we sat down and began to play the piano. And, and 30 minutes later, we had written this song, man. It was wow. finished. We went back to church that night and sang it for the first time. And the Holy Spirit just moved in a big way. And we knew there was something special about it, but had no idea what God was going to use that to do, you know? Yeah. You, you know, when somebody's a real songwriter, when they can uh, hear something or, or see a, a, a sign or a church sign somewhere with some kind mm -hmm. of phrase on it, and they can immediately sit down and write a song in 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. I've tried to write song. I've written a couple, but I have to sit there and think, okay, what, word rhymes with this word right here and uh, how can i make this sound like uh, not other another song i've heard before you know if i have to think all that stuff i'm not a writer yeah. you know <laughs> well people get it a different way sometimes you know yeah. and there's sometimes that i have to labor over it and the single that i'm about to release right now uh it's called there's a strange wind blowing and mm -hmm. i've got a video out on uh youtube about it but mm -hmm. uh uh I wrote that song one morning in eight minutes. I mean, you're I you're definitely a songwriter. <laughs> I sat down and wrote it, wrote it out on a piece of paper, I like was being dictated to me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I went and got the guitar and came in here and put it on my iPhone. And my wife said, "Did you just write that?" I said, "Yeah." She said, I, "From the time you went in there to sit down to right now, it's been eight minutes." Wow. I, you know, but I, I've, se I've seen the video. It's it's well, it is an awesome song. It's a, it's a, I think it's a song for today, yeah. you know, but, um, yeah, it's all God, man. That's the, he gives us that talent and we just our instruments in his hand. That's all. So how did, uh, how did you get it to gold city? Uh, Stan Schumann was, was, a, he's a brilliant songwriter. He's a great songwriter. And, uh, when we had went and recorded that with the, with the accords, we went up to Nashville at RCA and cut that record. Uh -huh. uh, Larry Goss played piano on it. I mean, it was, it was so a you great guys record. actually recorded it first before. Yeah, we recorded it first. Okay. And, uh, uh, Stan though, uh, got a highlighter and highlighted all the songs on the album he wrote and sent it to them to pitch it to them for, because he heard they were going to be making a new album. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they sent him back a note and they said, uh, we're not interested in your songs at this time. However, there is a song on the album that we would like to use called Midnight Cry. And so we got in touch with them and, and then they recorded it and the rest is history. It's history. Yeah. Yeah. They just, it was a last minute thing with them. They made that decision in the studio to cut that song. And that song has been recorded by countless groups, artists, you know, literally, Probably more than 15, 20,000 people have wow. recorded that wow. song wow. worldwide. Yeah, I've heard it in about every country in the world and about every language, you know. And yeah. <clears throat> it's kind of weird. I've heard it done as a bluegrass song and a techno pop yeah. song and wow. contemporary. And that's, that's, that's really awesome, man. So, what's going on with you now? I know you're doing some solo mm -hmm. work. Yep. And, uh, so, you've, you've been in the, uh, Christian country industry and the uh, inspirational country yeah. uh, industry. Now they call it. Yeah. So uh, what's been going on with you the past few years? Well, I've uh, been touring, uh, doing uh, concerts and revivals. I preach as well. I'm ordained. And uh, you preach like your been, mama? No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite as, I, I'm, I'm not quite as animated, <laughs> not as animated as mom, but yeah. Uh, 
but uh, we've been pastoring a home church in our living room now for the last uh, 16 years. Really? Every, win every Wednesday or Thursday night, depending on what time of the year it was. Now it's Thursday permanently. Yeah. Uh, but we do it. We do a live stream now on Thursday nights from, for our uh, for our home church. So you actually and, have people uh, come to your house for church? Yeah. Really? For 16 years now. Yeah. That's cool, man. It's, this is their only church. that. Uh, and yeah. most of them work at the hospital or are working where they can't be at church on Sunday. So we're yeah. the only option they really, you know, have other than a brick and mortar. And, yeah. you know, we have uh, seen some amazing, amazing things God's done through this little, little work. Uh, over the last 12 years, Selena and I have been to 42 countries as missionaries. Uh, wow. Traveling with uh, the World Race, which is an extreme mission opportunity for young people. Between the ages of 21 and 35, they go to 11 countries in 11 months. Every two months, we go to wherever they are around the world and spend a week and week and a half with them and debrief them, do some training, uh, yeah. some teaching, some uh, counseling, uh, some rear end kicking, and get them back uh -huh. out for the next two months. And yeah. uh, finally, uh, we go to training camp with them as well in North Georgia and uh, come home and we're kind of plugged in with them for the rest of their, their life. A lot of them, they're still like our kids, you know, man, but, uh, that's, that's awesome, man. I didn't know you did all that stuff and you, you, you keep pretty busy then. Yeah. That's all we do is ministry, man. It's just literally our whole life. We don't, uh, that's, you know, man, you, we live a very you, simple life. You've lived it, man. You've been there and done that and, and been around some awesome people over the years. And so during this coronavirus thing, when everybody's quarantined and, you know, all of our dates got canceled. And mm -hmm. what have you been doing? Well, since February 11th, <laughs> we've been sitting at home. But, February 11th. Uh, yeah, that was our last date. And uh, we don't know uh, right now if it's, if it's right now the way it looks, it's going to be the 1st of June before we're able to get back to work. Yeah. Uh, everybody's still a little, a little fearful about it. Uh, even though I think they're going to open the country back up here pretty soon. Uh, I hope so yeah. it may take a little bit for people to get, you know, brave enough it, to yeah, get brave enough and get over it. You know, yeah, I, it'll I, happen. I, We're going back pretty close. I've got a full schedule in May and I'm sure hoping it, it works out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, I had to cancel the end of March and all of April, you know? And so, yeah, but, uh, the Lord's been good to us though. He's, you know, he's people have stepped up to the plate and, and uh, donated, you know, offerings to us and sent us checks. And we've sold yeah. CDs and T-shirts online. And so we've yeah, done a lot of provides, Facebook Live stuff, you know. And so it's God has been good. Yeah, he, he provides for us. And that's what, you know, so the way it is when you're, when you're full-time in the ministry, and you know this, I know, uh, you adjust your lifestyle to that. Yes. You know, we don't buy things on credit because I don't know how much money I'm going to make next week. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And uh we've been kind of going on love offerings for all these years and we don't yeah. really have what they call a flat right. fee unless somebody's charging yeah. tickets, you know, that yeah. I'm going to get paid. But uh, other than that, we go where we're called and uh, it might be 25,000 people there in some of the places we sing and other places it might be 25 people there. Yes. But we sing exactly the same way everywhere yes. we go because that's what we're called to do. Right. And um, we live pretty simply and, uh, just trust God. That's all. That's what we're all supposed to do anyway. You know, just, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to have a lot of pastors, the churches I've been to in the past, that are going to be watching this. And uh, mm -hmm. I just want to recommend brother Chuck to your church. I, I appreciate that. Uh, if you never heard, if you like good old traditional country voice, this guy's got it right here. I mean, <laughs> he, he could sing, he could sing with anybody. He could sing, he could have been uh, a country singer and been very successful, but he chose to sing for Jesus. And I, I commend you for that well, because you got the talent, man. You still do. Well, I appreciate it. I'm just too old now. I'm just too old. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> Hey, you're as young as you feel, man. What? Oh, yeah. I'm six, 62 is the new 32. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. I'm, I feel, that's how old I feel. I feel if like you're, that. if you're like me, uh, I'm 56, I'll be 57 in October. And, uh, I that's try to, cool. I still try to do stuff that when I was in my twenties, I just, you know, oh, yeah. my body says no, but my mind's yeah. saying I'm still 25, you know, but right. But, uh, well, man, Chuck, 
this has been an honor for you to come on here with me and do this. Well, I've been Jim. honored to be with you, Bobby. I'm and proud I, to get to be on this. I really appreciate it. I, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff I didn't know about you. Well, and I, I think a lot of people out there listening are going to say the same thing. And, uh, you know, like I said, if there's any pastors out there, have, have Chuck come sing in your church. You won't regret it. If you need him to preach, he can even do that. A lot, a lot yeah. of people ask me, do I preach? And I don't. Now, I'm just a singer. I can share some testimonies, but if you can preach and sing, that's an extra bonus right there. So well, y'all have, uh, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, Chuck at chuckday.com, or they could just go to chuckday.com. There's a link there to get in contact with us, but uh, you can reach us that way pretty easily. And uh, we'll get right back with you. They can go to your Facebook page. Yeah. Chuck day on Facebook It's facebook.com slash Chuck day music. Chuck and Day they, music. Uh, they and, uh, the uh, they'll be able to hear uh, songs and videos, see videos of you. Yes, and you can also look on. Uh, we're on uh, Spotify. We're on uh, iTunes. Uh, we're on uh, App, Apple Music. Uh, everywhere music is found, we're there. YouTube, all that stuff. So, yeah. So Just you hear you up. hear Chuck's voice. He's got a, a very low, deep voice. I mean, <laughs> I wish I had that low of a voice. I mean, he could just. <clears throat> Sing, sing a little, just, just to give them a little sample of something. Just, uh, I don't know, Midnight Cry or whatever you want to sing. Oh, no, Midnight Cry is too hard. <clears throat> well, today I started loving you again. And I'm right back where I've really always been. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that gives me goosebumps, man. Yeah. <laughs> that would make Don't me take cry, much, Paul. Then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chuck, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate this. And uh, I encourage everybody to go check out Chuck's Facebook page, his website, uh, buy his music, pastors have him in your church. Dude, that'd be awesome. I appreciate it. I need some work. It works since February. So yeah, <laughs> man. Help him out. Help him out. <clears throat> we, um, uh, let me encourage you to to keep going with this. Uh, don't let this just be a quarantine show. Oh but no, it's it's not. Once this once this thing's over with, uh, you're doing it with a spirit of excellence. You look good at and and oh, your, back, your background and everything, and you've got a great <laughs> personality for this. And I think this is a ministry God's got for you right here. That's going to be uh, instrumental in helping people. And uh, well, you know, I really appreciate that. Doing. Like, I mean. I just wanted to, I felt like the Lord was leading me to do this uh, because, you know, people don't know people. They like, they think yeah. they know them. Right. They don't know where they, their roots and where they came from and what they've done. So it's an eye opening experience for sure. Yeah. I got uh, my eyes open a little bit because we all, have, you know, you were talking to uh, Kent on his show and about uh, how that, that uh, you guys kind of get, the uh, honor of being the people that started all this, but how the DMV band actually yes. is the people. And, and I brought back that memory and I thought, you know, I've said that same thing. I've said, well, mid South got this all kicked off, but, but uh, when it all comes down to it, man, uh, them guys back there, that was that stuff. When I heard the first time blew me away. Well, if you really want to get technical about it, you have to go back to the Oak Ridge boys. Yeah. I mean, when they were singing gospel music and they were switching over to country, they were right. they were still singing gospel music, but it was a uh, you know more of a country thing going. You want to go before to. that? You go back to the Lubin Brothers. Well, yeah, but they got their record deal. They were a gospel act. Yeah, and you can go to the Gatlin Brothers too. You know, the Gatlin Brothers they used to sing yeah, gospel. So hey, yeah. God's been in this music. It's all His music anyway. Exactly. Exactly. People talk about all oh, that's the devil's music. No, man, no, that's no, God's no. music. And God created it all. He created music. Sure the devil just perverted it. That's yeah. why he got thrown out of heaven. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, thanks a lot, Chuck. Yeah. Hey, uh, I got one question for you before yeah, you go. Go ahead. Do you know why the Asian people hate the new modern country music so much? I didn't know they did. I thought they loved it. No. They don't. You know why? Why is that? Because it's terrible. Because what? It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, the, oh, the new bro, the new bro country. It's supposed I get to be what you say. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. The the new bro country music. Yeah, they, they they think they don't like it because it's terrible. They love Bill the Anderson. Old, they like Bill the Anderson. Bill Anderson told that. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one, man. <laughs> Thanks again, Chuck. See you, man. God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye-bye.